to winemaking actually since a, a preteen, so it's probably not the greatest thing to confess to people, but <laughs> my father, uh, coming from Scotland, Great Britain, the, the tradition of country wines, and so he would always have a, a gallon or a 10 gallon jug of uh, apple wine bubbling at the back door, and, and then there was that one Sunday afternoon from, you know, Damnation, where he had us all going down picking dandelions at the uh, the school playground to make dandelion wine. So I have firm memories of uh, making wine. But part of that, I learned about basic things of sanitation, uh, oxidation. And I was a budding young biologist and chemist. So it was all very fascinating to me. So that's sort of where my wine interest started. And from there, I I went to grad school at UC Berkeley, and that's, of course, right next to Napa, Sonoma, and everything else. So there was a lot of research to be done. <laughs> so we did a lot of research. And, uh, and also, I was actually part of a wine cooperative when I was in grad school. We, there was a great place in Berkeley where you could go, and, and wine growers would post extra crop. And so you could go up to Alexander Valley with a pickup truck and fill it up with Chardonnay grapes and come back and make your own Chardonnay. So I had a group of guys who were into that. So we did that, and it actually came out OK. There's not much of it left. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so that explains sort of my level of expertise. Uh, and as a scientist, of course, I work across the, the way here. Um, I'm going to tell you mostly about uh, the kind of things we do here in the lab and how they relate to wine. And uh, there's actually quite a few. So I'll, I'll try and make it um, as scientific as possible. Um, but when you think about wine, uh, just about every aspect of making wine, sensing wine, growing grapes can benefit from a scientific approach. And you can be sure that uh, what we call terroir, uh, where the wine comes from, how it's made into wine, involves a lot of uh, analytical approaches, how fermentation's carried out, how to make it go right and what goes wrong when, you know, and how to fix it. Uh, and finally, uh, I think one of the take-home messages for today is that our sensory apparatus, our, our tongue, our nose, um, we're all really individual in that score, and we all experience the world differently. Um, and I think genetics is just catching up to that now. Uh, and I'll give you an example of how uh, people who study you know, genetics of sensation have actually found wine components that we respond differently to. Different people smell different things. Um, 
So starting out with tier one, just a brief overview, what is that? So wine, of course, is grown in, in every environment you can imagine. So all 50 states of the US grow wine, even Alaska. So uh, of course, an important part of that is what the chemical conditions of the soil are, what grapes you choose to grow. You look at European grapes, uh, why do they only grow Sangiovese in you know, Tuscany? Uh, well, it's because it grows well there, and the day length, the temperature, it tolerates it, it ripens at the right time. So these viticultural practices of when to harvest, preserving the right ripeness, but also acids and other flavor components, uh, it really depends on where you grow the grapes, if you're going to get a product that's going to give you something that people like. And of course, the uh, so this... These, these approaches, the climate, the soil, which grape you grow, and then how you make it. Are you making it with chemical pesticides or are you doing it organically? All these things impact how we sense or the wine product that we, we enjoy. Um, if you think about fermentation, uh, getting a little closer to science here, fermentation makes a lot of the things we consume, right? So soy sauce is fermented. Uh, Cheese is fermented. Bread is, is loosened by carbon dioxide fermentation from baker's yeast. Um, with wine, uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae is the uh, principal ally we have in making wine. And a nice close-up of our friend is right here. These are scanning electron micrograph of individual yeast cells. And what's kind of interesting looking at them is you see all these little bowler hats on them. These are um, so-called uh, budding sites where these creatures grow by budding off a new cell and then fission, so it's an asexual reproduction. But the yeast, I mean, beyond fermentation, yeast has been a core model for understanding cell division, understanding how the structure of a cell is put together. So there's an incredible amount known about yeast, and you can be sure winemakers know even more that they won't tell you because they all have their favorite yeast to produce their uh, signature brands. So when you add sugar to a solution that contains a yeast cell, of course you know that fermentation happens, but this is actually an energy generating process. So the, the, the expansion, if you add a small inoculum of yeast to a five gallon jug of grape juice, it, it rapidly takes over the entire volume with a, a very active fermentation, but also active growth. And as this happens, CO2 is made, so you have a, a bubbling top of any fermentation, and the ethanol will rise to anywhere from 12 to 15 percent in a, in a normal wine fermentation. And that is what feeds back to limit the growth of the bugs of the yeast and depletion of the sugar also limits their growth. So uh, if you look at a fermentation happening, there's this boiling mass of, of uh, fluid, but it subsides and the uh, yeast cells eventually die and sink to the bottom. But that's not the end of the story. Uh, in most wines, in fact, other fermentations take over after that. And this is where it gets kind of interesting. So if you look at a, a, a jug of wine, you have this sediment of yeast cells. In there are also bacteria that achieve this, what's called malolactic fermentation. And I think you all know what it is because I'm sure some of you like uh, creamy Chardonnays, for instance. Uh, that creaminess is because malolactic fermentation has converted malic acid, which is more of a crisp apple flavor, to lactic acid, which of course is in milk, creaminess. And the reason it, it kind of softens the edges of the wine is that, let me see if I get that to work. Um, acidity in organic acids is from what are called uh, carboxyl groups. And this is a carboxyl group. That's a carbon with two oxygens and a hydrogen that floats around. And that's an acidic group. And you can see malic acid has two of them, but if you liberate a CO2 from, from that malic acid and produce lactic acid, there's only one. So on a mass scale, on, on the same mass of acid, you only have half as many acidic groups. And that's why a malolactic fermentation can be a good thing if you want to reduce the overall bite or acidity of a wine. But 
maybe maybe you don't want to do. They want to preserve some mouth-watering freshness. So winemakers will let some of their grapes or some of their wine go through a malolactic fermentation and maybe preserve others or, or pull it off the lees, which is what I had up there before, uh, before it, that happens. So you can balance the acidity and this creaminess. So that's, that's something to know about in terms of fermentation. Saccharomyces isn't the only player in town. There's other yeasts. Bretonomyces is another yeast that people experience with wine, but more prominently with beer. It's actually intentionally added to beer to get the, a lot of Belgian aspects have Bretonomyces used to, for the fermentation. Problem with, uh, with wine and Bretonomyces is that it, it can survive the higher alcohol levels that kill off Saccharomyces, the usual yeast, and it can keep going in a bottle after it's bottled. And it can not only metabolize sugar, but also esters and other flavor components, fruit acids, and produce these wonderful uh, aromas, barnyard, leather, or sweat. And I know some people like barnyard. I'm not you know, putting that down. But uh, in fact, I'm, I'm convinced I actually like Bretonomyces, but we can talk about that later. Um, so there's a lot of complexity to the organisms, and certainly the study of microbiology is a, is a huge element of winemaking. So what about this uh, sensory uh, appreciation of wines? How, do, how does that happen? And how do our own personal sensory abilities impact how we perceive wine? And so when you think about what you're doing right now, you're putting some wine in your mouth, uh, you're certainly tasting it on your tongue, but you're also smelling it. And there's also what they call retronasal olfaction, where whatever you um, consume through your mouth eventually gets up your sinuses and impacts your olfactory neurons up here. So it's actually an interesting experiment to, to drink or taste things with your nose plugged. And then you can you know, see how much of it's on your tongue versus your nose. So I recommend you all try that. <laughs> might be a little different. We need some straws here. Do we have straws? Um, and I think uh, Scott makes a strong point that the experience of wine is influenced by this, but also by how the wine is presented to you. So what Scott's done is he's brought some um, really slightly higher quality wine glasses <laughs> with a, a, a better a globe that... It, I don't know how many of you had this experience, but you get a great bottle of wine, you bring it to a friend's house, and all they have are plastic glasses. Right? <laughs> and you pour it, and there's just nothing there. You know, you can't even smell it, right? <laughs> this is wine glasses really do create an, a surface area for the wine to become volatilized. It keeps that cloud of volatile compounds within a closed space that you can get your nose in. And so Scott is... Uh, brought some nice wine glasses you can try taking what you have in a glass there or getting some more and comparing how just the presentation of the wine matters any comment correct correct <laughs> <laughs> i passed the test <laughs> all right so what happens when you taste the wine well it certainly goes across your tongue and uh your tongue senses essentially five different uh tastes right there's um, sweet, salty, sour, bitter, and this umami, which is the amino acid kind of protein um, thing that we, that's why MSG is in all Chinese food, I think, is to give you that umami flavor. Um, but Scott informed me of something relevant in terms of this anatomy, which is if you just take a glass of wine and down the hatch, the front of your tongue misses all the fun because it's in the back of your mouth before you've um, even sensed it. Right? So to get the full appreciation of wine, you really ought to you know, soak your tongue in it somehow, subtly, you know, <laughs> nothing, nothing obvious. But uh, it's important to know that you do have these different taste buds in different parts of your tongue, and you can maximize your enjoyment by making sure the wine gets to all parts. When you drill down on that and look carefully uh, at the tongue, each little bump on your tongue or papilla has these taste pores, and under them are nerve cells with these hair-like projections called microvilli underneath. And this is where 
the rubber hits the road in terms of taste sensation. As things wash across your tongue, they're interacting with these little hair-like structures. And buried in the membranes of them are taste receptors. And once, for instance, a sweet taste binds to a molecule, binds to a receptor, it initiates this biochemical cascade ultimately leading to the opening of ion channels. And maybe some of you know that your, your nerves work on a bioelectricity basis and that when you change the permeability to ions in a neuron, it can transmit an impulse. And so that's what's going on while you're tasting these wines. Your, your tongue is sensing flavor compounds, uh, opening ion channels, and boom, uh, transmission to your brain. And that's what you're thinking about right now. I was really hoping to have a, uh, an experiment we could do, but Amazon screwed up today. So um, the experience of taste varies with different individuals. So you, you're, we all have a different genome. We all arose from different long ancestries. Um, and with that came different genes. And so taste receptors are no different in terms of that. Um, so for instance, the bitter taste of coffee, chocolate. Um, some people can, can taste that much better than others. And in fact, there's specific compounds that some people can't taste at all, uh, but are very strongly bitter to others. And it's because of uh, base pair changes or changes in the protein structure of these uh, gustatory or, or taste receptors. I'll give you another longer, hopefully not boring, uh, explanation of that. How about smell? So the bouquet of wine, of course, is what it smells like. And we have a nose for that. And we also have uh, olfactory neurons. These green things here have similar kind of hair-like projections upside down this time. And these little dots represent an odorant or an aroma that interacts with the cell membrane on these little hair like These would be like 10 microns big. They're really tiny. Um, and so in that membrane, you find a similar arrangement. You have a, a receptor that binds to an odorant, and then a signal transduction cascade that ultimately yields uh, an influx of ions that causes the, the taste receptor to pop and fire. Um, Minor digression. My lab studies these things. They're called cilia. There's a structure that holds out from the end of a cell like an antenna, and they put receptors on them. So we've been interested in these structures and these cells for quite some time, and we wanted to visualize how these cells fired when you put an odorant on them. And so we, over across the street, we have fish that um, have uh, a biosensor in taste receptors in what basically amounts to a fish nose, okay? So all these little flask-like cells have the cilia in here, and they, that's where the external world meets the fish. And so what I'm going to try and show you, of course, this may not work because of some snafu with my computer. Oh, look at that. Um, all right, so let's see if I can get this to work. Is that going? Yeah. Yes. And nothing's happening, right? And that's because there's nothing in the water, okay? It's just sitting there. And then this one, this is what happens when you add an odorant. So a little flash there, we added an odorant. And I think soon you'll see the cells start to pop. Oh, wow. <laughs> so this is a fish smelling bile acid live. <laughs> and that's what's going on in your nose. <laughs> if you smell something good, those cells are popping. And, and you can use biosensors for lots of visualizing. The fish are great because they're transparent. We can do this in living things. And we're using biosensors in many other ways to study uh, regeneration, uh, other uh, bigger bigger problems than smelling? I don't know. I don't know. I have to decide if that's a bigger problem or not. <laughs> yeah, it depends on the smell. <laughs> depends on the wine, probably. All right, now we're going hyper geek, okay? So strap in. <laughs> and um, I thought I'd just tell you about how 
And everyone's heard about genetics, right? And how, you know, genetics is finding disease genes and, uh, you know, understanding our heritage and all that. Um, not that long ago, it was found that gen genetics has been used to characterize humans' ability to smell compounds in wine. Uh, and this group here, oops, that's not the right thing. There we go. Um, used uh, a whole bunch of specific compounds and tested people for whether they could smell high amounts. Or they gave them a different concentrations of known compounds in food and asked them, can they smell it? Or what was the threshold where they could smell it? Um, and so this uh, rather complicated little figure here is essentially the number of people who can smell that um, at these different concentrations. So you'll see that most people, for instance, can smell 2-heptanone uh, at this concentration. Most people can smell phenolic <coughs> acid at this concentration. And a lot of these are found in, in, food in foods and in fruits. Um, the one I'm going to point out to you and try and use as an example to talk a bit about genetics is this uh, Beta ionone. Okay, so beta ionone is present in uh, prominently in Pinot Noir. It has the smell of violets. Um, it's also in chocolate. So it's a great molecule. Okay. <laughs> and when you give people uh, glasses with different concentrations from like one part per billion to one part per million, What's interesting to these authors was that, that it wasn't an even distribution of, of, of people who could smell it at sort of a medium uh, concentration. There were two groups. Some really required a high amount of it to smell it, and others required a much lower, they're much more sensitive to it. And so this suggests that the people in this study actually have a different, really different uh, sensitivity to um, this compound. So. How do you take advantage of that to find out how people smell? Um, the basic idea of any genetic approach is if you have a group of people that has a specific feature and you compare them to another group of people who are not selected for anything, there's a chance you could find that particular part of their DNA that is specific to this group but not present in this group. And in this case, it's, it's people who are sensitive to beta ionone and people who are essentially insensitive. And the procedure is to isolate DNA, characterize the sequence, and then look for any differences in the, in the, the entire uh, genome-wide association of, of traits. And for the percept about there, you'll notice that I have a spelling mutation. Yeah. That has uh, <laughs> infected my slide. Um, but here's an example of an outcome of this kind of study. Looking across all chromosomes of, a, of this human set of people, they found only one site that had a high association of a specific genetic marker with the affected, with the people who could smell. And what's interesting about that is when they looked underneath to see, well, what's on chromosome 11, it turned out to be genes for olfactory receptors, so these guys. And so then that led to further analysis. Essentially, they were able to identify a gene that encoded a receptor that lets us smell beta ionone. And they were able to say why people who couldn't smell it that well had a different sort of sensory experience. And so all of genetics is really comparing groups of people carefully selected for traits. Of course, you can compare healthy and diseased. You can compare tall and short. You can do anything. And that's the wonder of genetics. That's really complicated enough. You can also look at, at human populations around the world. This is what the level of data now. There's so many genomes sequenced and analyzed out there. You can take your data about smelling wine and ask, well, how, how does this play out around the world? And so long story short, in this sort of complicated map, um, the less sensitive to beta ionone would be that orange right there. And so you can see there are populations here who really can't smell violets that well whereas others can. And that sort of maps 
the distribution of human populations as we migrated around the world and then had babies and passed on our traits. Um, okay, so that's beta ion, and I, I brought some, and so you can smell it. And if we're lucky, we'll be able to do it right, and we'll see if you're sensitive to it or not. So, uh, I, uh, disclaimer, we won't be genotyping anybody. <laughs> The last thing, and I'm trying to keep it short, um, is in addition to nice smelling things like violets, um, there are some pretty nasty things in wine that you should know about, and some common nasty things, for instance, corky wines. Has anyone here had a corked wine? Do you know what I'm talking about? Okay. Well, um, we know why that is, we know what, what gives you that scent. Uh, corked wine is due to the presence of a compound called 246-trichloroanisole, or TCA. And for anyone who hasn't had the luxury of smelling this stuff, it's basically old newspapers in the basement. You know, it's a nasty kind of musty chlorine edge smell. Uh, and the difficulty is that actually estimates are 3 to 5% of all corked wines are, have this flaw. So it's, it's not uncommon. Uh, and it's caused by a sort of complex interaction of fungus, uh, chlorine in the environment, and that exist in corks. And so the, the wine can, can get this from the cork. The, the fungus can spread through a whole winery, which is a huge problem. It can be on individual batches of corks and not others. It doesn't require that the corks be bleached to sterilize. That was the common perception before, that when you bleach a cork, a cork um, that induced this reaction. But in fact, most cork production has gone to peroxide sterilization now. There's no chlorine in peroxide. So, and they still get corked wine. So it's really something to do with this fungus. Um, so it's, it's not a great thing. And uh, it also leads into a discussion of whether the whole wine industry wants to go with screw caps. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that one got a reaction. <laughs> How many people think screw caps are a good idea? It's about half and half. There's, there's a real pork uh, aficionados as well, but it does come with this liability. So, um, okay, so that's me talking for a while. Uh, does the glass matter? Uh, you have the opportunity to try the wine you're drinking in a different glass and see if the sensory presentation matters. Um, I brought some uh, beta ionone dissolved in water at one part per million and one part per billion. And if we want to get crazy, we can also add it to some wine, see if we can smell it. And then we're saving the best for last. We're going to make sure you're all trained in um, smelling corky wine so that you know when you get a cork wine at a restaurant, you don't have to accept it. You can send it back. It's, it's legit. So, but that is uh, locked in the kitchen right now so as not to pollute the whole room with <laughs> TCA stench. Uh, so uh, I invite you to, uh, let's see, have I got anything else? No. So thanks for coming again. And uh, thank you for coming.